very vocal. So let's see. And here we go. Back from the holidays. It's Mrs. Radio Show, as I sometimes call it. I've got Eric Kimberling in the hot seat from Third Stage Consulting. How we doing, Eric? I'm good. How are you, John? Good to be here. Fine. This is your first time on the show, but man, you and I go back a long time in this industry. We probably shouldn't even dwell on that at the moment. We'll start to feel ancient. A bunch of old timers <laughs> talking about the old days of the industry and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like back when the classic rock songs that we both like uh, were actually being played on the radio, you know, like it's crazy. But anyhow, oh, we're here to still being What's played that? on the radio stations I listen to. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, exactly. So, uh, all right. So we're going to be deconstructing digital transformation today um, and basically kind of talking about why it so often, you know, comes up short. And this is inspired by one of Eric's recent blog posts, but this is like something that, that you go pretty deep into. Uh, and you've prepared a couple of countdowns for us on uh, underrated keys to digital transformation, but also keys to how digital transformation falls short. So I'm really looking forward to going through those and I'm counting on our audience to, uh, to poke us a few times uh, during this conversation as well. Um, but uh, Eric, I do want to also give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your business model, because I think you're doing something kind of interesting because first of all, your you're, you, third stage is an advisory and services firm, but you you're, you really are independent in the sense that you don't take any vendor money. And that's pretty rare in our industry. And I feel like that gives you an interesting opportunity to, to really provide customers with like, a, a, when you say independent, it really does mean that because you're not taking money from vendors. So. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, you know, our, all of our revenue is derived from our end clients who are the people or the organizations that are actually implementing the technology. So most ERP vendors and system integrators and bars, um, are getting commission or some sort of kickback from the software vendors, which is a brilliant model on the vendors part. Cause you get these right. you, you people out there promoting your product because they make money off it too. And so it's, I see why they do it, but there's no one out there representing the clients or there wasn't anyone out there representing the client side of things. And so that's why, that's why we started the company. The other interesting thing about third stage and, and how long has it been around now? It feels like it's been, is it five years now? Uh, almost four. It'll be, before years in April. Okay. The other really interesting thing about what you do is that if I didn't know better, I'd think you were a publishing company. I mean, you you proliferate content. Uh, you do a ton of video, uh, and you also your your blog is extensive. You also have various studies and reports. Uh, I feel like you're drinking my Kool Aid about how content and you know really earns the trust that that is sort of the bedrock of like the modern sales and advisory. Not many people really drink the Kool-Aid that I try to serve up there, but man, it feels like you've got your own recipe for it. Like that must, is that working for you? It is. That's where most people learn about third stages, either through our YouTube channel, one of our YouTube channels or, and or the blogs that we put out. Um, you know, we just started doing it just because, it, you know, what better way to, you know, first of all, it, it, if you back up, I just like to help organizations. I mean, at, at heart, I'm a consultant. That's all I've ever done. I like helping companies. And so that's sort of where it started was really just, you know, putting content out there that would help companies. But then we found, well, wow, this is actually turning into a lot of business for us. So let's do more of it. And so we just sort of cranked it up over the years. Um, the other part of it too, though, is that, you know, what better way to figure out if a consulting partner or a potential consulting partner is going to be a good fit by kind of testing them out, like listening to what they have to say, listening to how they think. And, you know, and if you like the philosophy, great, you're going to want to work with us and you might find that's not what we're looking for, in which case that's okay too. So it's, it's, it is a good way for us to connect with the, the intent, our intended audience, which is, you know, very, very specific. Yeah. We could probably have a long conversation about the content part of that and why that's so important, but uh, it does create a lot of fodder for our discussion today because you, you posted a year end blog on what you learned from digital transformation 2021 that I'm really looking forward to getting into because it really kind of gets into why digital transformation falls short, which I think is a really, really important topic uh, for all of us in this industry who, you know, I, I'm somewhat something of an advocate for transformation. I think a lot of people like you and me are, but we are accountable for the results. Like if we're going to advocate that, we also have to show that it's working. <laughs> so exactly. that 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 gap there, I think we we do need to to address. And one one cool thing about uh, our show today is, in addition to preparing some exclusive material for me, uh, I get the chance to dig behind your blogs because. Uh, your blogs show up pretty frequently on my hits and misses best of the week. But if I ever would would have a criticism of your blogs, and this is just for me personally, a lot of times I'm like, 
uh, Eric stop before he got to everything I wanted to hear from him because you have a very like concise style of blogging, which I think works well for you. And, and I'm probably one of those people that just likes a lot of the meaty details of things. Mm. Um, but now I have you. So now I get, now I get to force, <laughs> I get to force the issue. And I've also, wow. I've also challenged you because I know that change management is one of your big themes uh, on, on why these projects succeed or not, which I tend to agree with, but I've challenged you to, uh, to, to be very specific about what aspect of change management we're referring to. Cause I think, I think it's a really important topic, but it's also a really, really broad topic. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. so, uh, you know, I want to, I want to see if we can hone in on exactly when we use that phrase, what does it actually mean? So, so I've got, I got you on the hot seat a little bit, but I think you're going to do fine because you've been living and breathing this for a long, long time. So, and I've been watching your show, so I kind of know what to expect. I yeah. Know you, you know, I know, I know your tricks. I know what you're going to pull on me or I think I know. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And also feel free to turn the tables from time to time. It's totally fair game. Uh, Marine is asking for the name of the blog. It's uh, third stage consulting third stage dash consulting.com um that's for our audio listeners i'm actually going to paste marine into the chat uh the um blog on what he what eric learned from digital transformation in 2021 um and then you can also derive the the blog url from that as well uh so thank you marine and marina counting on a few spicy comments from you so i'm glad you're here early so so eric before we get into the countdown i, I actually want to get into this blog post a little bit um, there's there's a phrase in here that I really liked uh, that really stood out to me. Whoop! I got to get you got to get your white paper pop up. Boy. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, there's some really important themes in this blog, but but there's one quote that I really want to call out here, which is, "I'm still surprised each year that goes by that we as an industry haven't yet figured out how to make digital transformations more successful. I think until we figure that out." that's going to be a drag on the digital transformation space. Wow. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's just, you know, year end, you know, you know how it is during the holidays, you sort of look back and reflect on, you know, how things went, what you accomplished, what you didn't accomplish, what you want to accomplish in the next year, what you're grateful for, all that stuff. And so that's sort of the mindset that I had uh, at that time. But, you know, looking back, you know, I wasn't just looking back at 2021. I was starting to think back, um, back to the late nineties, you know, you and I started, I think around the same time in, in this industry. And you kind of think of all these things that have changed technologically. And there's just all these new advancements in AI, machine learning and composable ERP and, you know, all this stuff that is, is newer, but then you look at the underlying the surface of how companies try to go through these implementations and so much has not changed. And it's, it's amazing to me that we're still repeating, you know, you see it all the time in the industry. I think you see it too. You still see, a lot of these same um, behaviors and patterns that have led to failure, they just keep getting repeated by the same organization, sometimes the same people. So it's just fascinating to me that we figured out the, technolo the technological piece, but we can't seem to figure out all the other stuff, which is more important than the technology, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Maureen says, I'm oh, still surprised we haven't figured it out. It's a total drag. Crazy. Um, I agree. And Alan is talking about the paperless office. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's funny too, Alan, because the pandemic really exposed us, right? Because we thought we were paperless. And then when we really tried to work remotely, we found out about all the different things that, oh yeah, just one piece of paper. But when you're not supposed to be in your office at all, you find out how important that one piece of paper was. Uh, right. So, <clears throat> but you know, Eric, you, you call into, I think a hugely important point too, because like in the nineties, I wrote, I started writing a newsletter called the extended enterprise. And I was so psyched. I was like, it's XRP now it's not ERP anymore. <laughs> and, uh, I was like 25 years early on that. But, but I think one of the interesting things is like, I don't think I was wrong that of this notion that we needed to be much more external in how we think about software. And I think if, if you and I were to hash this out, I think that's one of the things we'd come up with is that accountability to external constituents like like partners, supply chain partners, customers, and, and even employees is way more important than just an internal focused ERP project, right? But, um, but, but at the time, let's face it, the technology wasn't there to realize what I was talking about. Whereas now I would argue the technology is largely there. I mean, granted, some of the integrations and data silos and stuff are a challenge. But I don't think, to your point, the technology is what's holding us back anymore. And yet, there's still so much struggle on the ground. 
So I think to your point, doesn't that really call attention to what we're doing wrong from either a people or process perspective? I mean, yeah, occasionally maybe some vendor oversells some software that's not a fit, but I don't think that's at the heart of the problem we're having now. Do you? No, I, I don't. I mean, I think, I mean, I do think, I, let me caveat that. I guess I, I'd say, I do think that the, you know, sort of like our ability to change is moving at this pace, but technology is moving at this pace. And so the gap between what technology you can do and what our ability as humans and organizations to adapt to that technology, um, that gap, that chasm is getting bigger. So, so in some ways, yeah, I think it does. Um, I, I think that's, it is partly to do with the technology in that way. Not that the technology is bad. I think mm-hmm. the, the problem is the technology is too advanced for a lot of organizations. Like you think about artificial intelligence, um, we're struggling to find some like real meaty use cases of how organizations are using artificial intelligence today to operate their businesses better. We know we have the vision from the vendors. We know what's possible, but actually getting it in use pragmatically, it's just most organizations aren't anywhere close to being able to use it, partly because the technology is still emerging and also because their data is not good enough. And I don't want to go down an AI rabbit hole here, but I'm just giving you that yep. as an example of how technology is there, but organizations can't seem to catch up to the technology. But I, to your point, all the other stuff is even an even bigger issue, all the people, the human and operational sides of things. Tracy, good to see you. Tracy Webster back in action. Agreed. Great at technology. That doesn't matter if we don't get the process and solution strategy right first. Well, Tracy, I think you've come to the right place yeah. based on the content Eric has for us today. Uh, Eric, so so tell me a little bit about, have you attempted to quantify like how transformation falls short. I know you do some research type projects. Are you starting to get a sense of of what these failure rates look like? Or I mean, failure is kind of a tough word, right? Because sometimes failure is more like just underperforming projects. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd say like failure, failure, like the big massive disaster, like Hershey's or um, Haribo or um, National Grid. You know, some of these well known failures. The, that's pretty rare, to be honest. I mean, that might be five or ten percent at the most of implementations out there. But you hear about them because they're big companies, and it's a big deal when they can't ship product or whatever. The bigger fail, I'd call it the bigger failure, is the other eighty percent or so that are just sort of moderate failures. It's not a total unmitigated disaster, but man, they spend mm-hmm. way too much time and money. They're losing a lot of business value that they should be getting out of the project. Whether or not you call that a failure, I, I guess that's up for debate, and it's very subjective. But that that's the bigger risk is that those moderate failures that you don't hear about every day. Yeah. Tracy's actually moving into the solutions part of our conversation, which, which uh, I'm going to kind of postpone a little bit, but I will read this quickly. Uh, she says the biggest piece is the appetite for change. It is the consultant's job to position opportunity and help clients think through it and push until they get that light bulb moment. Does that resonate with you, Eric? It does. Yeah, Absolutely. And yeah, Alan is pointing out collaboration, lots of tools, but very little in terms of people and process. Yeah, I think collaboration is a great example, Alan, because we're trying to, it's like these Slack channels pop up and we start using them, but we're not even sure how the data in those channels interacts with our core CRM systems and everything else. So, um, yeah. and then uh, Tracy, you're all people. Tracy, we're glad that you feel that way. Um, and, and, and Thomas, uh, I'm going to be bringing up your post later. So just so you know, um, I'm expecting you to get ornery in the chat. So just so you know, I'm aware of your post <laughs> and, and the light that you shed on the conversation. So, uh, so Eric, just a little bit more on this blog post, because I think it gets to some, a couple other really important points. Um, you have, uh, you talk about forced digital transformations that can you tell us, tell, tell us more about like, what is a forced digital transformation? Yeah. So there's, there's two layers to it. Um, one is what I think a lot of people have been talking about over the last two years since the pandemic, which is a lot of organizations were were forced into digitizing, digitize, man, I cannot pronounce that word to save my life. Yeah. They're trying to go digital. How about that? Yeah. They're yeah. trying to uh, create digital offerings within their organization or, or go through a transformation. And that was because, you know, so many office workers were forced home and it, they just had by necessity realized that their internal systems wouldn't support that sort of flexibility and that sort of model. But the, the dirty, dark little secret that's another layer of, um, of forced transformation, which I know you, you like the controversial stuff. So let's just get right to it. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the software vendors kind of forcing, um, 
forcing their legacy on-prem customers over to the cloud. I think that's forcing a certain amount of digital transformation prematurely in some cases. Um, we see a lot of clients where, you know, honestly, we, we say to them, why are you doing this? Just because a vendor's mm-hmm. telling you, you have to go to the cloud. That's, that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible reason to do it. I mean, if you have other reasons, great, then have at it. But if, if you're doing this only because of your vendors telling you, you have to go to the cloud, um, that, that's a terrible reason to go through a transformation and go through that risk and heartache and cost and all that stuff. Yeah. And I would add to that. I think we're in a, in a crossroads here in the sort of pandemic economy where, Oh, we got everyone on these remote work projects, which was so important for business continuity. So we pat each other on the back, but how much do we really transform our business? How much do we really change to capitalize on the opportunities of today and protect ourselves from some of the risk? And one of the other things, as far as risk factors you go into in the post is, is just how supply chains got exposed as part of this and this ongoing supply chain challenge. And then also the people challenge, which is really important. Could you, could you comment on, on that because I, th- I thought that was interesting how you basically acknowledge like, Hey, I underestimated a little bit on, on how important the HR piece was. And I really like that you did that and kind of called yourself out a little bit. What, what was your view there? Yeah, there's, there's actually a few of them in that blog where it's, it's like, I sort of thought maybe this would be a thing, you know, looking ahead in, in my predictions, but then you look back and it's like, well, I, I was off, you know, cause I didn't realize how big of a deal it was and in the, the HR side of it, I guess I didn't realize what I was not anticipating were the the extreme labor shortages that so many of our clients are experiencing. I, I, you know, you kind of thought, you know, coming out of the pandemic, of course, you know, supply and demand sort of gets out of whack a little bit with with the labor force and especially people getting sick and, um, you know, or having to quarantine or whatever. You know, there's things that, that will strain the labor market to some degree, but I didn't realize how, how significant that would be. So organizations that can really keep uh, their employees sticky, keep them engaged, keep them excited, motivated, and committed to the organization. That's a that's a rarity today, um, just because there's so many people quitting their jobs and moving into different industries entirely, or even just quitting their careers in general. That um, it's it's hard. You know, th- there's labor shortages all, all over the place. It, I think most, if not all, of our clients are struggling with that pretty significantly, and that that surprises me. Tracy and Thomas are having a good back and forth in the chat about whether you need a consultant to drive transformation. Or, or not, and I don't want to get too sidetracked into that at the moment, but what I will say in response to this chat is I'm a strong believer that you need a truth, an, an unaf- un- unafraid truth teller as part of this process, and I don't think that's often available internally, so that's mm-hmm. my view on that, but I think it could be internal. It's just it requires someone who has the political courage internally in an organization to call people out and call processes out. I don't think that's always easy to do. Yeah, but um, agreed. So I want to continue to sort of paint the problems that we're facing into a full picture, and we're going to do that through your countdown, and then we'll move on to to sort of the more hopeful part of like, you know, how we can kind of get things to a better place um, in, in this coming year, because that's why we're in this business, right? If we were in just just doing this to trash things, I don't think any of us would be employable. So, right, right. Uh, but but you prepared a countdown of your top five. Uh, sort of keys to like underperforming projects or digital transformation failures, however you want to. So, so start us off with one of those. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to readjust my setup here just so I can. I yeah. Can yeah. And I, I can actually my... expand the screen a little bit to give you a little more room. Oh, great. That's perfect. Um, all right. So how do you, you want me to just jump right in start at number five? Count yeah. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's do one at a time, but we might bunch them up a little bit. So start with sure. one. Let's see how we do. All right. And I, and actually, just so you know, uh, John, you, you asked for some unique content and you're getting unique content. You're actually getting, uh, you're getting a preview of a YouTube video I, I filmed that's coming cool. out either next week or the week after. So this is a, something that hasn't been released yet, but it'll be released shortly. So you're Excellent. the first. Scoops. Excellent. So, so uh, this is why the top five reasons why digital transformations come up short. And you also asked me to be asking me to be specific and sort of cover things that, you know, you don't always hear about. So that's, that's exactly cool. cool. All right. So number five, uh, bias. So, ooh, tell us more about that. So it's it's you get bias either on the solution or the technology and or the way uh, that solution should be deployed. And so um, there's there's product bias and then there's uh, strategy or implementation bias. And 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 that latter part gets back to the thing I was just talking about about how nothing's changed in some ways as far as how we implement mm-hmm. the same we make the same mistakes over and over again. We, you know, we defer to the technology. We, 
Uh, we assume that we don't need to define our future state because the software is going to do it for us. You know, you make some of these fatal mistakes that were were happening in the late nineties are still happening today. So that bias is a problem and it sort of creates an, you sort of have this echo chamber in our industry where all the consultants are sort of doing and saying the same things over and over again, repeating the same mistakes and causing their clients to, to run into trouble. Um, and then the other part of bias is the product or, or technology bias. You know, I, I'm a, I'm an SAP guy or I'm an Oracle guy or gal and, that's just what I know. And therefore everything kind of fits in that. It, it has to fit in that world. And the reality is every organization is different. Every organization has different needs and you, you have to sort of take the blinders off and, and have an open mind. So that's really what I mean there by, by bias. Does that bias extend to prime vendor bias in a sense of like, in, in your experience with projects, like kind of falling back on like, well, they're already a prime vendor. They're the ones we always work with. So they'll be good for this project too. Do you run into that a lot? Yeah. Yeah. You get that. You get the, um, the, the mindset of no one ever get fired for hiring insert big system integrator name here, whether it's Accenture or IBM, Deloitte, whoever, um, you get that bias too. So executives think, okay, if I hire Deloitte or Accenture, or IBM or whoever, how, you know, of course it's going to succeed because, uh, I'm, and, and it's safe, it's a safe bet. But what we find is it's actually in many cases, a high risk proposition to go with those same, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the same players. Are you able to uh, broach those issues with customers? I know this is a little bit of a, like it's communicating these things is a little delicate. How, how would you sort of help a customer to wrap their heads around the concept of bias? Because I could see how sitting down with a customer and saying, hey, I think your bias is getting in the way here would be an awkward way to put it. So how would you put it to a customer? Well, you know, you frame it in the context of trade-offs, right? It, you know, there's never going to be a silver bullet, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's a, a certain type of technology or even an implementation methodology or approach, there, there is no one size fits all answers. And, and there's never a perfect answer either. No matter what you do, no matter what software you choose or, or the implementation timeline you put together, your overall strategy, no matter what you do, it, it, there's trade-offs there, right? And there's risk. And, and to think there's not going to be a risk or that you have the perfect answer, that's that's misleading. And so you have mm -hmm. to, so the way we do is we frame in the context of you have two options here. Like, for example, you could hire Accenture the pros and cons of Accenture, or you could hire a real solid tier two, second tier system integrator that's big enough, but not so big that you're going to get bombarded with, you know, 50 kids out of college. Um, or you could go with a really small vendor that you have, that's going to work really hard for you. They're going to be hungrier or scrappier because you're a bigger client, but they don't have the rest of the resources. So, you know, you kind of work through those trade-offs and you open up their mind to, wow, first of all, A, I have options. B, no matter mm -hmm. which option I choose, I do have there are pros and cons. And so that's generally the way we do it. We don't, we, I've never come out and told a client they're biased, but you, you sort of, <laughs> you help them come to that conclusion. Like, wow, we haven't thought about these different things. I like that, that view of, of kind of helping someone move them off of a more narrow way of thinking without kind of saying you're thinking narrowly, but just kind of being able to sort of show them what else is out there. And, and I tend to agree too with like specialty firms, a lot of times, having this aggressive quality that is worth putting in front of customers, even if they still end up going with Accenture in the end, really good to show them what a small lean outfit of experts can do. Cause a lot of times those are super experienced people that kind of banded together. Yeah. Bonnie Duncan Tinder or this vendor is at the top of the X analyst quadrant. So they must be the right solution for us. Yeah. Bonnie, you know how to stoke things up in here. Yeah. Um, and man, we got some heavy hitters in the chat, which is great. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I think that is a big part of the problem, right? Eric is that we, we're kind of, I think a lot of customers and, and people in general in this industry are looking for sort of the stone tablets of like, here are the documented top things, but it's it's not like that. It's so customer specific in the end and industry yeah. specific. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. And when, when uh, I don't know if you know the story or not, but I'll tell real quick if you if, if you can humor me on this. But when I was, uh, when I met my wife, um, she had two young kids and, and I didn't, I don't have any biological kids of my own. So we, we got married and I and suddenly I had two stepsons or two and five years old. And I had no idea what I was doing as a parent. So I read the book Love and Logic, which is about parenting and about giving kids choices and, and uh, teaching them to learn about consequences and living with their consequences. And it was super helpful becoming a new stepdad and kind of coming in cold, not knowing what the hell I was doing as a parent. But I found that was super helpful in consulting, too, because you, I don't want I don't mean this in a condescending way. Um, but when you're dealing with executives, a lot of times you have to treat, you have to use that love and logic approach where like, Hey, you own this decision. Like, I'm not going to tell, I'll tell you what I think, but ultimately you're going to decide what you want to do. And by the way, here's what I think the pros and cons are and the trade-offs are. 
So that sort of like ownership and accountability is it's it, that's the underlying thing that we're getting at with this is, is uh, yeah, maybe they're biased. Maybe bias is sort of the symptom we're seeing here. But the, the really underlying root cause is the fact they're not taking ownership of some of these decisions. And, and really what we try to do is empower them to to own it and be accountable. Bonnie has a stat here, and this came up in my conversation with Bonnie Tinder, the last one. So feel free to check that on YouTube. I don't like this stat, but I, I'm going to be prisoner of the data, Eric. Uh, and Bonnie says that her GSI versus in, independent firm research, she finds no correlation between customer success and size of consulting firm. And uh, I have a hard time letting go of like my romanticization of the small, nimble SI. So this is a tough one for me, but Bonnie, I'm going with, I'm honoring your data and I feel like I have to respect the data. One thing I will say, however, is I would like to see data points on projects correlation with success with a project that also has an independent advisor that is separate from the prime, because I think that's a hugely important part of the equation. And uh, I'll await the data on that, because regardless of the size of the firm, I want to see some independent advisors and consultants involved who are not tied to the uh, financial revenues of the main project. So anyway, but uh, Bonnie, really good point, And you definitely made me think there in our show. So yeah. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, wow, we got a lot of interesting comments. I'm not going to be able to go through them all. Um, but anyhow, some really good stuff around the experience levels of consultants. Uh, so Eric, what else you got? We, we've only gotten through one. So let's get through a couple more here on your list. Yeah. So I, I'm hoping you like this one, but number four is uh group think. Ooh, yeah. So you get companies that, uh, the internal project teams and even their consultants are sort of with, they're in their four walls or their, or their war room, their project team room or whatever, and they sort of just turn inward on building technology and, you know, mapping out requirements and processes and testing and all that stuff. And they, they lose sight of what's happening outside. Both when I say outside, I mean, outside, even in, internally within their own organization and ultimately how this affects their customers and other stakeholders, you know, that are going to be affected by the project. So that, and the other thing too, that goes along with group things, sort of like bias is you start to hear what you want to hear and you feed off each other. Like, Hey, things are great. You know, we're right on track. We're on schedule. We're on budget. There's no risk. We have, we have no, we have nothing in our risk log. Things must be awesome. Everything's green in our status report. And you, you start feeding off that and it creates this, this these blind spots all over the place where, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of uh, just going with a herd versus really challenging and, and uh, you know, challenging, you know, or what are we missing here? Cause there's always blind spots. There's always risks and, so that group thing, I think, could be pretty. Uh, that's number four on my list. Yeah, and and one thing that the audience might not know about you, Eric, is is you, you've been an expert witness. You've seen a lot of court ERP and uh, enterprise courtrooms where you've served as an expert witness on these troubled projects. And when I when yeah. I read when I read about these projects that go awry, like terribly awry, like the ones that wind up in court, so much of what I'm struck by is how you you're like how far how did you get so far down this horrible path without kind of that gut check moment of, Hey, we're kind of heading in the wrong direction here. And I, I think one of the big things for our industry is to figure out how to have these gut checks that, that create a sense of accountability and, and a more objective report card earlier on in these processes. So we don't get like two to three years because by then you are in court, right? Because by then yeah. it's too late. Yes. And, you, you know, back to Bonnie's point about uh, there not being a correlation between size and success rate of, of your SI. One thing the big SIs are really good at is they are brilliant at making you feel good about an impending train wreck. Um, and I was part of it. I mean, I saw I had partners I worked for when I was 25 years old. And I was like, how did you do that? How did you just convince the client that everything's fine when everything is not fine? <laughs> like we have mm -hmm. massive problems, but the client walks away feeling good, like, okay, we're, we're, we're yellow status. You know, we're, we've got some challenges, but we've got a plan to address them. But meanwhile, be, behind the scenes, you're like, this thing's falling apart. The wheels are coming off, but yet we're doing the CYA thing where, you know, these big SIs, if they've got millions of dollars per year at stake, they're going to do whatever they can to make you feel good and make you feel like, Hey, everything's fine. Um, and that's the other, you know, that's sort of maybe an underlying thing. Uh, undercurrent of some of these top five is he, is that dynamic with your system integrator and um, not challenging them enough, which I don't want to, I'm, I'm jumping ahead to another one in my top. <laughs> oh yeah. You don't want to spoil your own countdown. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and just real quick on group think, and we'll get to the next one. Uh, 
isn't part of group think kind of department think too, right? Because I think a lot of these projects historically were too departmentally focused and, and they didn't think enough about different constituent groups inside of organizations that were also impacted. So that's got to be part of it too. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're just viewing the world in your lens of what I need, what I want, and you're not thinking about, um, you know, kind of the broader picture there. Vigorous chat. Nice job, folks. Uh, okay. What's your next one, Eric? So number three on my list is trusting the experts Experts, and probably the qualifier I should have in there is blindly trusting the experts. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's kind of building on what I just said about the SIs and sort of blindly saying, okay, they tell me everything's fine. So everything's fine. Or what's, what's just as bad is when you get uh, organizations that say, well, they're the experts. They know the technology. I don't. So we're just going to let them handle this. That's super dangerous and unhealthy. It creates this really weird, codependent, unhealthy relationship that doesn't end well ever. Um, and I mean, I mean, ever. Um, mm. in, in, you, so you have to have a certain amount of internal ownership and accountability. And mm. even if you hire independent advisors to help you with that, you, you need to have someone that's looking out for you and watching uh, the hen house, I guess you'd say. And you don't need the, the wolf guarding the hen house, uh, which is usually what happens with the SIs. And so the SIs tell you what you want to hear. They're playing CYA because they've got a lot of revenue at stake and it just, and then you don't have any ownership. You're, you're suddenly now you're overly dependent on the consulting on the experts because you haven't built the competency in house. So that that's something to watch for is just blindly trusting the experts without challenging them. Hi, Luca. Welcome to the chat. A lot of customers are outsourcing everything and losing control. This causes them to be guided by consult. I think that's one of the huge points that, that you've made today underlying everything is this need for customers to take more ownership of, of of their own projects and you know and 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 in part part of it is embracing that your business and your users know more about your domain than anyone and right. no no one can come in and, and tell you that um crawford's got an yeah. interesting comment here coming up short has its roots that there is no education as to expectations across the business there's a real scarcity of different departments knowing what to expect and demand at any given point in a project, especially when it comes to moving to the cloud. I think, again, you kind of come up with this problem of that not enough ownership, right? And, 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 and where the value of the consultant can be to kind of tell you what else is happening in your industry and where other companies have gone wrong. But in the end, you have to make those decisions and own those decisions, which is a little uncomfortable, right? It's in many ways, it's more comfortable to say, well, I put, you know, I, I don't blame me. I, I, I had so-and-so SI take responsibility for that, but it's like, no. Yeah. That, that doesn't work long-term. I mean, someone has to be accountable, but to your point about, you know, how these, these big failures get to the lawsuit phase and you read about it and you're like, how did that happen? How did you not catch that six or 12 or 18 months sooner? It's because of that dynamic. I'm trusting the experts. I'm outsourcing this. Um, they're telling me everything's fine. So everything must be fine. Or they, or worse yet, things are way off track, but they've got a plan to get it back on track. Um, mm. if they're the same ones that got you off track, the odds of them getting it back on track are slim. So, yeah. And, and to me, that's part of the promise of where we can go with this conversation in the next uh, 30 minutes is, is, is how we can apply these lessons with better technology to create more transparency across all of these projects. Right. Because that's this big thing that we need in this world right now is more transparency into whether it's our supply chains or whether it's our, project management we need to we need to see those things the technology is there to do it you know Absolutely. but but is the cultural will there to do it that's what we're going to find out yeah. all right are we on number two now what do we got for number two in, in the we're on number two and that is failure to see the big picture so in other words we don't we we get myopically focused on the tech stuff and you know building and testing all, all the stuff you can see and touch and feel which is usually the technology but then missing all the other stuff, the, the operational implications, the people implications, the organizational design, whether or not this project and what we're building is even aligned with what we're trying to be as an organization. Uh, is it aligned with the culture of the organization? Is it is it better support our internal employees? Does it better support our customers? Is it making us a better organization? You're kind of losing sight of all that stuff in the name of just building some cool new technology. So that's what I mean by failing to see the big picture. That's a, that's a big driver for failure. And, and just to kind of turn that around, what if you saw a project where there was a tendency to not understand that big picture, how, how would you sort of address that with a customer? How would you help get them on a better track with that? 
Yeah, it's it's kind of like your question about how do you tell a customer that they're biased without telling them they're biased. It's mm-hmm. the same thing here. You know, how do you how do you tell a, you know an organization they're screwing up or they're missing a bunch of stuff without just flat out telling them? Sometimes we do. I mean, in this case, I think it is more safe. I guess you'd say to come out and say, hey, you know, here are some things you haven't thought about. Here are the risks. And I think framing it uh, in the context of risk management is one way to do it. And then the other way to do it is just, again, with the trade-offs, like you can keep doing what you're doing. Here's what that's going to look like. Or you could do this and here's what, and that's what that's going to look like. It gets back to that parenting love and logic thing I was talking about before. You sort of give them choices and you highlight what the trade-offs are and what the consequences and the upsides are for each of those potential decisions Mm. and make it their decision. We always make a recommendation. We think you should do it the right, you know, what we think is the right way, but ultimately it's your call. You're the, you're the organization. You've got to live with this. So, you know. We'll support you however we need to. Thomas says not losing the big picture is important. Still, one needs to be able to take small steps, think big, act small. Uh, and and actually, Thomas, uh, in the intermission between the countdowns, I want to get into your your piece real quick. So be standing by in the comments. Okay, Eric, what's your number one way that we can get off track in our digital transformations? All right. So if you have like, if you had a journal, if you had a, like a professional studio and producers and stuff, they would probably do a drum roll right here. But uh, uh, let's we'll see. Just... I have, I have, I have an applause meter. There. So <laughs> it's it's still still premature, that. but yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's see if, let's see if you lived up to the applause. I know. No, I like, oh, that's, there's a lot of pressure. This might be a letdown. Uh, no, but number one is uh, misalignment and misalignment being, you know, misaligned internally, we're not all on the same page with what we're trying to accomplish and or this transformation, this project is not aligned with what our overall goals and objectives as an organization are. So I'll give you a quick example. Company A is a high growth company. They've gone out and acquired a bunch of uh, bunch of other companies. They're PE. They've got PE money. Uh, they've acquired a bunch of companies. And now as part of their transformation, they need to figure out how do we tie this all together? We've got a bunch of pieces we've acquired. We're all acting like you know, 10 different companies, how do we start acting like one company? So standardization, common operating model, that's all important to us. But then you go through your digital transformation and you start taking this agile approach where you don't define your end-to-end processes, you don't define the common operating model and you just start deploying stuff. And right there, that's misalignment. You're, you're going this way when the organization is trying to go that way, your transformation's, you know, diverging from that. So that that's what I mean by misalignment is both alignment between the project and the overall organization and also even just internally um, agreeing on how much do we want to standardize? What areas do we want to standardize? um, How much of our technology? Looks like Eric froze up here for a sec. This happened once before. Eric, I want to, let's see, I'll, I'll pop you out of the stream for a sec. I think Eric should be back in a second. So, uh, Anyhow, Thomas, this is a good opportunity for us to get into your to your blog post a little bit here, uh, which I think is going to be informing where we go from here with this conversation. So I'm just making a quick note, and then I'm going to put this in here. Uh, Thomas Webernet, who is in the chat today, wrote a really important post last year. Uh, actually, it was December 2020, so almost last year, called Digitization digitalization and digital transformation a stake in the ground and here we go with the link and i think eric's back Sorry eric you're back excellent back. no worries we still have the ghost of you so now there's another you like in the in the <laughs> in the dashboard but i think we're good we got the live you so that's like fine. the song the ghost in you really yeah. Well, well that we stopped it. You lost at a good point there because we're kind of in this transition and I just posted up uh, Thomas's blog post on, on the distinctions he made between digitization, digitalization and digital transformation. And I don't want to get too semantical in our discussion today, Eric, but I thought Thomas who's in the chat today made some really interesting points and I'll just read you a couple of, of things that he kind of goes into essentially that, that each one of these is a different level of, uh, commitment and cultural sort of, uh, I don't know, transformation around change. So he says, digitization, the process of converting analog into 
a computer readable format to improve existing processes processes in other words digitization is about doing things better and then he talks about digitalization which he defines as creating is using this technology to create new processes it's about doing better things so that's a little bit of a distinction there instead of doing mm -hmm. things better doing better things and then he says digital transformation is about doing entirely different things and i think that's and he talks about this organizational transformation across values, culture, mission, and vision using an outside-in view. And in my mind, that's a little bit of an insight on where we get stuck because we tend to view this more like a tech thing, whereas his point is that the higher level of this is much broader than that. And yeah. I had an interesting conversation yesterday with uh, Qualcomm about a bunch of stuff they're going to be showing at the NRF retail show and sort of the future of retail. And I think retailers are a really interesting example of this, Eric, because how can how can you have a customer driven transformation if you're a retailer, if your store associates are disgruntled, indifferent, poorly trained, unhappy, and exploited? How can that right. possibly be a good customer experience? And yeah. and so so to me that really calls into question what are you doing with your technology, right? You know, yeah, buy online, pick up in store, whatever, seamless, seamless. Eventually we have to interact with people. And you have to start thinking about how your people fit into the picture. And I and I think some people have kind of said, well, we're just going to automate the hell out of everything. And that's how we're going to solve that problem. But I don't think that works. I think eventually there are people involved in this. You can automate some stuff. But in the end, how, how you treat your people, how you empower your people, and what kind of roadmap they feel they have for their own growth, I think is integral to all of this. And so to me, that that's a real clue as to like how we go wrong with these projects is we don't incorporate all these things. So, yeah. Yeah. Back to that big picture comment. And, and to Thomas's point too, I think there's, you kind of have to view your, call it what you want. I mean, let's just call it a transformation, but it's, it's varying degrees of uh, magnitude of change. Are you just are you kind of just making some incremental improvements? Or are you trying to totally transform your business or are you somewhere in between? And that's another piece of alignment you need to have as an, as a team your executives might be expecting this big, massive quantum leap or a true digital transformation, like Th Thomas says, but then your project team ends up treating it more like a, a digitization project versus, you know, uh, something right. more significant. And that there's misalignment right there. So it's a, it's a good point. So now we're, we're in the uplifting part of our program. We're actually going to talk about like how, how we change things for the better, how we get more products off the, at, across the finish line. Although Tracy Webster, you made a great comment earlier about how, go live and handshakes and smiles, uh, you know, is not the end of things. And uh, so, so Eric, let's, let's kick into your countdown on some underrated keys. Cause I wanted, I wanted you to push beyond some of the classics of like, oh yeah, of course we have to think about change management and training and, and that's all really important and I don't want to diminish it, but let's yeah. hear your top, let's, let's hear your top five. Let's start with one of those with underrated keys to digital transformation success. Well, first of all, I just have to um, give you a hard time. It, it was very difficult for me to do this top five without mentioning change management. <laughs> now, I, I tried to be very specific. There are some change management themes, but you, you I yeah, appreciate fair it. enough. Because you, you would already know number one would be change management and be sort of a buzzkill. Of and course. So I think yeah. this is good that you forced me out of my box. So number five on my list is uh, non-traditional technology. And I know I'm starting off with the stuff that I always say is the least important, but this is important. And what I mean by non-traditional tech is that, um, you know, back when you and I started our careers, you kind of had this myopic view of transformation or, or digital projects, which was ERP, um, big single ERP systems, monolithic ERP. And now it's like, it, you still see a lot of organizations that are trying to, trying to repeat that model or that mindset when there's so many other options out there. You, you don't mm -hmm. need to just look at SAP and Oracle and Microsoft, for example. There's plenty of other best of breed options out there. You've got the work days of the world, the sales forces, um, service now, you know, some of these niche uh, industry specific or functionally specific providers. Um, and then you also have industry, you know, niche specific solutions as well. And then you've also got like open, open source software. You've got open architecture, different tools to use. So there's just so many options, which can be overwhelming to, to organizations that they end up reverting back to what they know best, which is, well, let me just go talk to SAP Oracle and Microsoft and see what they can do for me. So I think you have to look outside of the realm of just the normal, you know, big ticket ERP systems or enterprise technologies and really think about all your, all the options you have out there. Cause there's a ton of them out there. It's, it's pretty exciting. Luca, who confides that he's uh, sorry for the typos. He's typing from the cell in bed. Luca, glad you have joined and I hope to see you in here more often. 
if we're not connected, send me a, a connection request. Uh, and and also just to mention, uh, I'm aware that my my time for the show is unfriendly to European audiences, and I'm sorry about that. Um, some uh, customers have X number of products that do more or less the same things, different technology platforms. And he, his core point is customers have to watch out for license pitfalls. He uses the example of digital access and SAP and on SAP integrations and how Rise with SAP is trying to mitigate and simplify that. Uh, and look on this program, I don't tend to get too far into one vendor or another, but I have done a lot of uh, articles on SAP and Rise on Diginomica. I just did another one. Uh, on the syntax and ASUG study, which you could do a search for that gets into a little bit of your topics there. But I think Lucas' point still stands very well as far as that licensing is a major source of friction and also risk management around all of this stuff. And you do need to understand everything around data ownership, right? Which is core to this, right? Who owns the data? Who's paying for the data? Where does the data reside? I just saw this story come up from Australia about how... Uh, it, it was like basically saying that using Google Analytics is considered uh, illegal or, I mean, they're, they're still finalizing, but this whole notion of like where your data resides is a really big deal right now. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Eric, number four. Number four. You might like this one uh, too, John. Uh, this is uh, skepticism. Ooh. And you keep in mind, this is top five things that make the, the underrated keys to success. And, Skepticism is one. And, and the reason for that is because we as humans are optimistic. If we're effective leaders, we tend to be even more optimistic. And that optimism creates this set of blinders and back to that group think and the bias and you know you, all the stuff we just talked about and the, the things that cause difficulties in projects. So you, you sort of have to be, you know, for the North American people listening here, people from North America that remember uh, Debbie Downer from Saturday Night Live, you kind of need to be have a little bit of Debbie Downer <laughs> in you to where you're sort of like, yeah, things are great. Everything's green on the status report, but here are the risks or here are the challenges we're facing. Not that you want to be negative, but you know you kind of need that um, sense of reality, and you need to stay grounded. And I love it. You need a grouch on your team. This is awesome. Maybe my corp, maybe my corporate career prospects were not as terrible as I thought they were earlier in the week when I described myself as unemployable. If if you need to grouch on your team, like <laughs> I might actually right have reality. a cor corporate future, man. But no, I, I hear what you're saying too, right? Because there's a tendency to want to have this team camaraderie that's all about sort of this sort of like almost extravagant feelings of constant yeah. buy-in. Whereas to your point, like maybe it makes sense sometimes to pull back and say, hey, why why are you a little hesitant here? What, you know, your BS detector is going off. Why is that? Yeah, and just be critical and, and challenge you know, challenge the experts and, and, uh, ask lots of questions, you know, it, it, it's, and again, you can be optimistic while doing that. I mean, I, I, I use the Debbie Downer example. And if you've seen that skit, she's, she's very negative and she's sort of like a buzzkill. It's just like, everyone's having a good time. And then she comes along and it's like, wah, wah, and everyone just feel, you know, everyone's sort of down uh, about something that's supposed to be positive. So you don't want that. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit when I say you should be Debbie Downer. But you right. sort of need to have that mentality of what what am I missing here? Everyone's feeling good, everything's perfect, everything's great, everything's awesome. But I'm if that's the case, you're missing something because there's always some. I hate to say there's always something wrong, but there's always risk. You should have a pretty robust risk log, and you should have a risk mitigation strategy. And if you the thing that drives me crazy is when I see a project like in an expert witness case or a lawsuit where the SI has a risk management log and they they've got like three risks that are just super generic and no big deal at all. It's like, okay, then you, something's wrong. Someone's either lying and hiding the truth or they just don't know what they're doing if, if they've got three really high-level, basic, generic risks on their risk log. So um, I, I think that's just the reality of these projects. They're hard. Bonnie Tinner says, Chief Grouch needed on every project. This is awesome. If someone could endorse me for that on my LinkedIn <laughs> profile, that would really make my make my weekend. A whole uh, new advisory, advisory services for it is, you could be provided. Absolutely. There are often political things in play too, says Tracy Webster. If the sponsor at the end of the client is positive, a lot of times everyone will follow their lead. Awesome point. CIOs are guilty of this. CFOs, the executive sponsor is most likely to fall in that trap. That's a great point. Yeah, and uh, Crawford says Oscar for Oscar the Grouch for CIO, but voices of seasoned experience are often ignored. And it, it's true, right? I mean, we can't we can't transcend organizational politics, which is kind of what you've covered a lot during this discussion. Is that you can't always transcend all of that. Um, but what, what you can do is at least challenge it and make 
make other options more visible. Uh, Oliver Marks, who's a world-class uh, analyst in Grouch on Twitter, he he's, his comment didn't show up in the chat, but he says, A, you can't outsource the, strate the strategic spine. There has to be a there there. And he says, you cover the marketing spin immediately, but there's a naive internal belief in next-gen tech being ultra cool in the way forward amplified by suppliers. So that's a really relevant point there by Oliver, I think. Yeah. Very so, uh, and are we, are we number three on your countdown? Number three, we can do this real quickly because I've already, uh, already stole the thunder of this one and, and alluded to it. But number three is uh, challenge the experts. Um, it's your business, you know, and I say this for people that hire third stage, hire our company and our team, challenge us. I mean, it's your business. We'll tell you what we think, but ultimately you decide what, what you need to do as a business. And there's times where we make recommendations the clients ignore, or they say, yeah, we'll take that into consideration, or we did take it into consideration, but we're doing this and here are the reasons why. And it's not our job to judge or tell them they're right or wrong. We'll tell them what the risks are and we'll advise them and help them through that path. But ultimately you have to, you have to own this and, uh, and challenge those experts, especially when those experts have a lot to lose by do it, by not doing it their way. Um, that tells you right there, there's, there's a bias there. There's economic incentive that may not be aligned with your needs. Absolutely. Okay. Number two, number two, I don't remember what it is. Oh, and this one I, I alluded to already too, and that's risk management, risk mm -hmm. mitigation, being able to proactively identify a risk before they become felt. So in other words, you know, a lot of times companies will will get to testing or training sort of on the tail end of a, of a project, and then all these risks pop up and all these things that they should have known six, nine, 12 months earlier, they're just now finding out because they, they're seeing it, you know, materialize. So um, that risk mitigation and proactively managing risk is very important. One thing I took away from our conversation too, Eric, and tell me if I got this right. It, it seems you kind of have the point of view that, that everything has a sort of a risk management set of trade-offs that nothing is exempt from that. Right. Which I think is a kind yeah. of an important point, right. That, that everything has a set of pros and cons attached to it, which sort of gets to Oliver's point around next gen G whiz technology that no matter what it is, whether it's 5g or whatever it is you think is going to, solve your your woes in some area like there's always going to be a set of pros and cons right and so fleshing yeah. those out is a really healthy exercise yeah yeah and just knowing knowing those risks it's kind of like going in for open heart surgery you know you think okay i'm gonna go get open heart surgery and everything's gonna be fine well you know you still need to eat well there's a risk that you could die on the operating table i mean that that's a real risk and you've got to be the healthier you are the more you take care of yourself the more likely you are to not have that be a problem so it's just stuff like that. I mean, you have to think that these, for most organizations, even if it's a, a quote unquote simple upgrade of technology, it's a massive change. You, even the simplest uh, implementations are pretty significant changes. And, and anytime you go through massive change, that's a big risk to your organization because you're disrupting, whether you like it or not, you're disrupting your day-to-day -day operations. Thomas makes a point, very important advice solutions need to be explainable. I think that's true. And I think you know, in the age of so-called AI, that's getting more intense, right? Because now we're getting to this, this, this level where some solutions that are being put into place, uh, it, you, you're not explaining how you get the results. That's going to be a problem, right? So just because you get recommendations on inventory management from your AI system, you want to know why you're getting them. And that's something that that really needs to be conquered in many cases. Yeah. Uh, so Lucas says his personal tip is to have three offerings in order to compare dollars, assessments, and time to go live. <clears throat> you know, and, you know, I think one of my big things is like, you know, have a dark horse on your short list, you know, like before you just take your, oh, you start with 20, but your short list always looks the same in the end. It's like, right. keep a dark horse in your short list, you know, keep a real underdog in there. And, you know, Eric, one thing I think is really interesting and that I'm seeing a lot in the cloud SaaS ERP market is a little bit of a shift where uh, some industries that have never really had user-friendly multi-tenant software before, they're bending a little bit on their functionality demands in order to get better software that, that especially younger people want to use. Right. Uh, and, and so, but with the understanding that the vendor is going to continue to much more easily update that software than historically was possible with on-prem, right? And yeah. so, and so now, now that changes your shortlist a little bit, right? Because now you might say, "Hey, let's let this dark horse in that doesn't have all the functionality we need, but we really like how fast they're moving and how mobile and intuitive their software is." So, to me, that's part of 
my recipe for this is like, don't make your shortlist too conventional. Like have something on there that's going to give you some curveballs, even if you don't end up going, going with it. Yeah. It's a helpful exercise. Even if you don't end up going with it, like you said, because you, you end up seeing what your options are. You, you're thinking outside the box, you're looking at those pros and cons and, and sort of deliberately making those trade-offs. So I think it, I totally agree with you on that. All right. Before we get to number one, let's, let's leave that suspense for a sec. You, you did another post I really liked uh, towards the end of the year. What is the best digital transformation methodology, which of course is a little bit of a trick thing, right? Because you're not the kind of person who would say, well, you know, this lean six Sigma or whatever, like you're not going to fall, fall into like one bucket, but I thought it was really interesting. What inspired you to sort of compare and contrast different methodologies? Well, actually it was not my idea. I, I was, a. Uh there's a company we work with um, that they're, they're actually a VAR, but they refer, um, they refer you know, any, anytime client needs independent help, they'll refer us to them. And the gentleman that, that um, I was talking to was telling me about this client that he's working with. And he was taught, he used this phrase that really stuck with me. He said, it's sort of like the, the, the classic uh, clash of the implementation methodologies. And he was talking about how his client was struggling with that. He, the vendor had one methodology, they had their own PMO, and then the, the VAR had their own methodology. So they were sort of like trying to reconcile that. And so it just gave me, it, it, it just, I just got the idea from him. It wasn't, uh, wasn't my idea. I'd love to take credit for it, but it, it was his idea. <laughs> so what do you think is the, the benefit of that? Because I enjoy talking about this because I've come up with like in, in my little short short thinking around it, like different methodologies, like you can have more of a data and analytics driven transformation. You could have more of a supplier driven transformation. You can have more of a digital core transformation that's centered around your core processes and you're modernizing your ERP. I think there's so many different transformation models. Is that kind of what you were hoping to accomplish in that post is to try to get people thinking around like different ways to tackle the issue? Yeah. And, and yeah. And really just getting people outside of the one size fits all silver bullet mentality. Um, you know, I think the the one that really stands out to me is is probably the biggest culprit of, of creating problems in the industry right now is agile. You get a lot of agile uh, evangelists that are just passionate about agile and they're all about agile. You get certified in agile and agile on the surface sounds like a great way to counter those big bloated implementation failures of years past. But now, again, all you've done now is you've, you may have, you may be solving one problem, which is now it's not big and bloated. It's not moving quite as slow, but now you're moving fast, which is great, but you, you're oftentimes moving, moving fast. You're moving faster in the wrong direction. So mm. is that really helping you in the long term? So that to me, Agile, yep. you know, I don't want to pick on Agile too much, but that's, that's one example. Or you look well, at, just, yeah, go ahead. So sorry, Eric, keep going. I was just going to say, or you look at like vendor implementation uh, methodologies who have their sort of prepackaged way of doing things that it just can't work for everyone. One size cannot fit all. So that was really sort of the impetus behind it. Yeah. And I think one interesting thing on Agile too, is you have two other problems. One is that the word ad Agile is used quite a lot now in contexts that have nothing to do with the structured Agile methodology. And when it comes to the structured Agile methodology, yeah. When I talk with real Agile practitioners with a capital A, they often don't have very good answers for me to this day on how to do that across time zones and, and across international projects. Now, it's not that they have no answers, but Agile was created as a whiteboarding exercise with the team in the same room doing sprints. That's how it was envisioned. So translating that across time zones is not, right. not a simple thing, actually. So. I like what you said. Yeah. Nathan Crook, by the way, he likes the dark horse thing. He's made that choice before. Nathan, great to see you in the chat. And Tracy says, oh my God, preach. Agile is a theoretical thing. Um, faster in faster circles. In circles. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. moving faster in circles, Tracy, probably is not the outcome we're looking for in our projects. But it certainly does uh, make you think you're busy though which is like half the battle i suppose so listen we've held off on eric's number one key underrated key so now we're gonna do it eric what you got all right we're gonna we're gonna do it and uh again you wouldn't let me say just change management so i try i try to pick something that's change <laughs> oh, you snuck it but, in okay but very but very specific guys so this is change okay. management ish but it's uh very specific and that is and i've alluded to this on the previous countdown that's internal alignment if all you do on your project is you're aligned. You, 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 it may not be the best strategy. You may not have the best implementation plan. You may not have the best technology, 
But if all you have, if all you have is you, you're all aligned on what it is you're trying to accomplish, I'll take that bet any day over the one that has a better strategy or a better technology or whatever the case may be. So I think just getting aligned before you start your transformation, before you start implementing stuff, you better be aligned because that misalignment creates a bunch of friction and headwinds and it creates a lot of risk, time and money that most organizations don't have. So give you an example, and I'll, I'll pull Accenture uh, Deloitte back into this. You've got Deloitte in, they've got 50 full-time people on your project and you're sitting there trying to figure out what we want this project to be and what we want to be when we grow up. Those guys are billing whether you're ready or not and you're not ready if you're not aligned. And so you're you're paying these guys by the hour, the meter's running. And so you're you're ramping up the the cost, you're ramping up the risk and um, you know, so that that whole alignment piece is in my opinion the most important underrated key to success. And Eric, if you began to pick up on if you were working on a project with third stage and you began to pick up on a sense that there was some lack of alignment as as we put it how, how would you go about taking that on well yeah i think you know one of the best ways as humans that we can understand and relate to something as vague and nebulous as uh, misalignment is sort of painting a tangible picture of where that misalignment is so if we can look at operations you know operationally here's where we're misaligned uh, stakeholder and organizationally wise, here's where we're misaligned. You know, executives are saying this, mid-level management thinks this and prioritizes these things. Frontline employees are prioritizing things this way. You, you sort of have some very tangible, quantitative, specific ways that you're misaligned. It's one thing they use the word, a, a vague word, a vague word like misalignment. It's another thing to say, this is exactly what we mean by misalignment and how you're misaligned. It's sort of like change management. Change management is so vague. I think that's probably why that might be part of why you didn't want me to talk or use that phrase is because <laughs> it's such a big bucket of nothing. You got to get down into the the pragmatic pieces of that, that that are important. Yeah, you did a good job of avoiding my ire on that point. And <laughs> and, and still and, keeping it in. <laughs> yeah. I like how you, you got around my filter a little bit there. And and look, I'm like I said, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with with this change management like being important. It's just like, like, you know, I think Tracy in the chat talked about resistance to change and Marine as well. And like, you know, resistance to change is like a, a core thing here. Right. And you know, how, how we, how we overcome that is a big part of this. And one of the things I actually like about our current state, you know, I think Oliver is right that we're still in this sort of shiny new toy thing where there's always some new toy. But one thing I do like is that, there's a lot more pressure to get users to adopt software now. And so there's a lot less of this phenomenon of like, oh, we sold a bunch of software and we're collecting money on the licenses, but who cares if they're really using it or getting value out of it? You know, they're paying for it. We're good. Right. We right. we bundled we bundled it with some other stuff that they that they're using. And now like that that lack of adoption is a real vulnerability, right? And so that gets us back to the change thing, right? Because it's like, well they're not enthusiastically using this software. So that's a failure. Now that's right. a failure. And so why aren't they enthusiastically using that software? And to me, that's where your blogs come in is understanding that. And, and, and that's why I think it's really worthwhile for folks to engage with your ideas and why I wanted to have you on the show, because you don't just kind of blog different things at different days. You kind of have this whole view of, of the enterprise. And so thanks for sharing that with us today. Absolutely. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. Um, I want to give you a chance to plug your upcoming show. But first, Lucas says, I'd love to see 30 participating in a meeting and only three actually work and make the hard decisions. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure if that was sarcastic or not, Lucas. So I'm going to have to leave you to explain <laughs> that one. Um, <laughs> so tell, tell the folks a little bit about Stratosphere because it is free, right? They can register it for it. So, it so just give us the, like a little bit about that show. Yeah, so it's it's actually an event we started doing pre-COVID uh, in person, uh, you know, some, sort of a three-day session to kind of dive into all the different people process technology components of transformation and implementations. And what we, um, obviously during the pandemic, that shifted. And so what we did within 30 days of, the, of all the lockdowns happening in, you know, March of 2020, um, we decided, hey, let's move it, let's move it digitally and start offering it digitally and let's do it for free. So we just sort of just thought outside the box and just decided to offer the, the whole thing for free to a global audience. And um, so, so that's where it sort of all started. And we've done two or three of them, I think, since the pandemic. 
and it's a it's a three day event. I think it's six hours each day. I, I speak at a few sessions. Our, our team speaks. We have guest speakers from outside. Third stage. So a lot of different viewpoints on you know what it takes to make these projects successful. And again, it, the whole idea is to provide a, an event where it's not sales spin. It's not uh, rose colored glasses spin. It's more of a realistic view of this is what you need to be thinking about as you go through a, a transformation. So it's meant to be educational, cool. engaging, you know, collaborative with with people that are joining. We get a lot of good feedback and discussion from the people that join. Um, so I always learn a ton just from the audience. So um, you learn just as much from the people that are joining the, the event as the ones that are uh, presenting, in my opinion. I think Luke is confirming it was a sarcastic comment about the three actually working and making the hard decisions. I figured as much. Um, but yeah, and that's February 8th through 10th. So yes. um, those of you uh, who want to do that, just, just check out the uh, third stage consulting site or just uh, get the homepage. It's right on there. Stratosphere 2022. So yeah, I think I might around. definitely check some of that out. I, I, you got me a press pass to one of the last years and really enjoyed some of the, the conversations and there were some good customer discussions as well, which was really cool to hear the field lessons. Right. Cause that's, we can all learn from those. If we don't, yeah, it never ends. Absolutely. So Eric, thanks for exclusively revealing this content and having this awesome discussion and thanks this was an awesome chat you guys really came through today made it fun thanks for joining yeah. eric it was a pleasure to have you i'm sure we'll do it again at some point absolutely thanks for uh having me and thanks for doing the show it's, it's really entertaining uh, i always learn a lot and i always laugh at multiple times even when i'm not on your show i'm always laughing at half the stuff you say so i really appreciate because you just have a unique way of delivering uh some of these messages so and you have a cool. good market so i appreciate the opportunity to be here and Great questions from the audience too. So appreciate that. What's funny, because I've been writing about B2B content strategy and how it doesn't have to be entertaining, but I'll admit I do want my show to be entertaining, but but not not in like a production values way, just in more of like let's really get to the heart of things together. And yeah, uh, and and thanks everyone. You you guys were just fabulous in the chat today. So you, you really you made us all better with your comments. And and just by the way, upcoming shows, I might skip next week because I'm crashing the Constellation Disrupt TV show. Uh, Lucas says Eric's number one. Um, so you got a fan there. Um, nice. so I, I might not be on, on next Friday, but I'm going to try to do just about every week, but we'll see. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do a, an NRF retail show wrap with someone who's actually brave enough to be in Manhattan on the ground, which is not me. So, uh, but that's probably for two weeks. We'll see. Anyhow, thanks for joining today. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks guys. Bye.